Exactly, because they're they are getting paid, right? But it's like something crazy. It's like six cents an hour or something. Nah, picture me rolling, tipping my shelf. Niggas look jealous. You gotta control it. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the GBD Yang Podcast. Name change coming this weekend, or probably will already be changed by the time you see this video. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, I'm one of your hosts, Aiden Billing. I run GBD Reviews on Instagram. This is Daniel. He runs this page, reviewing, and also he helps run our collaboration page, GBD Yang, at this moment. So, as, as always, we're going to start off with some like film trivia. So, um, do you want me to start, or would you like to start today? You can start. Okay. Well, uh, I want to ask you, since we're going to be talking about uh, director Ava DuVernay today, I want to ask you, what is Ava DuVernay's first feature film? That's hard because I've only seen Selma and the two films yeah. we've done together. I kind of doubt Selma's her debut. I'm going to have to say it because I don't know what her other film is. So my guess is Selma. I'm pretty sure it's not. You were about two films off. She hasn't made a ton of films. Like after so much, she only really made one more. Plus that documentary, the documentary film we're going to be talking about today, along with you know, the your and thing. a wrinkle in time. She also made that. Yeah, a wrinkle in time. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, and um, basically her first film was I Will Follow You. Okay. Uh, it's not very unknown film. It's more of an independent. It was yeah. pretty good first debut I heard, but I mean I don't know too much about. It. I just thought it would be an interesting thing to talk about. So All right. what are you gonna? Yeah, so my trivia question was going to be, you know, we talk about Oscars a lot, but how many Emmys yeah. did When They See Us take home? Ooh. Uh, the Emmys. Just to be clear, this isn't a trick question. They didn't get, it's not like they got nominated at all, right? Oh. They got, they got nominated. I'll say that. Okay, all right, just make, making sure, making sure, because uh, you are known to throw curveballs sometimes. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's say four. One. It won one. Oh. For okay. Jarell Jerome's performance as Corey Wise. All the right. Actor in a limited series. It got nominated for a lot. Got nominated for overall limited series, director, yep. writing, and um, a lot of acting awards. Yeah. Okay. Joe cool. Yeah, All right. definitely well deserved. Yeah. yeah, for sure. As always, we have movie news. We got a quick yep. image of Kristen Stewart as uh, Princess Diana. Oh, sorry, Diana, yes. Princess of Wales, in Pablo Lorenz Spencer. I don't know why yeah. this is so popular, personally. I don't get it. I mean, I saw it. I mean, like, I think yeah, she definitely looks the part, but I think people are still kind of concerned about her just because of the whole Twilight movies. Like, it's the same thing right. that happened to Robert Pattinson, right? People doubted his acting chops for a very long time, but I think yeah. the film that kind of you know, turn everyone's perception of him around was good time, right? I don't know if you've yeah, seen that, but sure. like, I've seen it. It's film. Yeah, cool. but like, no, uh, I, maybe this could be the film that gets her more mainstream, like attention for acting jobs, because she is a good actress. Like, she's been in films like Clouds of Sales Maria, Personal Shopper. She's received acclaim for those performances, but not a ton of people have seen her. Right. And the last mainstream film she did was, you know, the new Charlie's Angels movie, which of course yeah, wasn't great. Was bad. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, but you know, that's all right. Maybe this can be a good film for her. I hope she does well with it. Yeah, for sure. We got some confirmation on Zack Snyder's Justice League debuting mm -hmm. on HBO Max on the 18th of March. It is confirmed it's R rating for violence in some language. Um, are you looking forward to checking this out? You know, yeah, I am. I'm also very worried because yeah. I'm not. Zack Snyder's track record with comic book films is very hit or miss, to be honest. I think he did a reasonable job with 300, but 300 is also a very visual film. It's not really about the yeah. story as much as it is about seeing, like, the. How do I say this? I guess action porn is a good way to describe yeah, it. It's like a very action centric film, you know, but I think just. The fact that this is being split up into into a four part mini series is crazy. I mean, yeah. there are going to be so many cool characters with this. I just, at the end of the day, I just kind of feel like the DCEU has been rushed. They've been yeah. it's been rushed to compete with Marvel. Like Marvel took their time with it, and I get it. Yeah. They had that luxury at the time, but in order to do this well, you really do need to take your time with it. And I think the solo DC films, based off character recognition alone, would have made a ton of money. So I really right. don't understand why they need to rush it. To be honest, who knows? 
Yeah, it's interesting. Um, definitely a unique. It's the mo probably one of the more unique projects I've ever done. I can say for sure. Definitely, yeah. A already released movie from a big property and turning it into like a, sort of another director's vision after getting fired. It's very weird, but. The internet demanded yeah. it, so they supplied it. Well, he actually didn't get fired. I think his um, yeah. his daughter committed suicide. That's why he had to step oh, away from the project. It was, okay. it was terrible. I feel bad for him, to be honest, but I'm glad he's able to complete his vision now. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thor Love and Thunder, the fourth Thor movie mm -hmm. directed by Taika Waititi's Begin Production in Australia. Um, yes. Very interesting to see. Um, this cast looks amazing. We've got the Guardians. we got Thor. We got the return of Natalie Portman as Jane Foster. We have yeah. Christian Bale. We have Matt Damon. Looks very, very cool. And Taika, I love Taika. I know that man thinks very well, but yeah. he puts his mind too. So looking forward to that. We got Ana de Armas, who says it took nine months to perfect the voice of Marilyn Monroe for her biopic, Blonde. <laughs> Yeah, I did see those set photos. She actually, she looks the part, 100%. She looks exactly yeah. like Marilyn Monroe. I think it's crazy, to be honest. But I like her as an actress. I think she's yeah. been very good, especially like the film that stands out for me is obviously Knives Out. I really yeah. loved her in that film. She was great as the character as yeah. the nurse. I can't remember her name exactly, but yeah, it's been yeah. a while since I've seen that movie, but Maria still, great film. Like yeah. yeah, no, no, I think, yeah, Maria Cabrera. Yeah, no, Martha very, Cabrera, that Martha. was it. Yeah, yeah. All right. yeah. Yeah, she's a very good actress. This definitely, like, you know, the Academy loves transformations like this. So yeah. very much looking out for her to be making Oscar buzz next year. Uh, yeah. Baz Luhrmann's Elvis biopic starring Tom Hanks is getting delayed to 2022. I really don't like Baz Luhrmann. I think he's a pretty cheap director. Um, Great Gatsby wasn't very good. Romeo and Juliet's pretty bad. I know there's one other movie he made that I don't like. Australia. Either. Right now, no, it wasn't that specifically. Something else, but oh, um, Moulin Rouge. It was. I think that's his like best work. I haven't seen it though. Um, yeah, but I just don't like him. I don't really care. I just mentioned it. Tom Hanks is cool though. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why. Wait, I watch who's it. playing Elvis in that movie? Do you know? Austin, this guy named Austin Butler. He was. Um, if you watched Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he was the, like one of the Manson kids. He was one of the guys oh. who says, I'm here to do, who does the signature line, I'm here to do the devil's work or whatever. Okay. And uh, yeah. Brad Pitt, six, the dog on him. That, that guy. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, no, I remember people that. People thought, I saw some speculation that people think that Miles Teller should have done his part. Should have been Elvis. You think? Uh, I, I mean, I, I could definitely see that. I mean, he definitely does look like him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I would have been fine with that, but I mean, like, you know, I'm, hope, I'm optimistic. I mean, We've yeah. seen unknowns, or I guess relatively unknowns, like yeah. in terms of speaking, like do a good job with like a bi biopic performance. Like for example, aside from my robot, not a lot of people knew who uh, Rami Malek was before, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody yeah. came out, right? And I, he obviously knocked it out of the park. So I think you know Austin Butler could do a good job. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, we got new poster for Juice in the Black Messiah, which debuted at Sundance. Sundance is the film festival takes place at the beginning. Also, the beginning of every year. Um, it's getting a lot of acclaim. Dan Fluey in particular is getting a lot of praise for his performance as Fred Hampton. Uh, the movie is also being praised for its direction and cinematography, so it's looking to definitely be an awards contender at the Oscars. I personally think they'll probably take home some supporting actor. Yeah, no, I could, I could see that happening. I've heard a lot of good things about it. I really do want to see it now, actually. You've yeah. been hyping it up to me, I and mean, like, I've seen all the good press. Yeah, so I'm hyping it up for myself, for hyping it up for you. Yeah. Looking forward and people are hyping up in the press. Yeah, for sure. I'm very looking very much looking forward to seeing it. Your goes Lathimos and Emma Stone are gonna reteam for a Frankenstein reimagining called the Four Things. What do you think of Your Goes Lathimos? Well, I'm just trying to think, what has he done? Like Favorite, the lobster, the killings of a sacred deer, and dog poop. I believe there's like four. I gotta say, all f all of those films very out there. With the exception yeah. of the favorite. I think the favorite's pretty like, you know, tame. You know, in comparison, comparison some it's of like, other work, yeah, some of his, yeah, yeah, like I think I I saw bits and pieces of the lobster. It's a very weird movie, but it is kind of funny and it's like you know construction. Yeah. But I mean, 
do we really need another like Frankenstein thing? Like this is just getting annoying because yeah. like I'm sick of all these like reimaginings. Like, no, yeah. look, we've done this already. Can we please try and right. do something new? Like I understand it's hard to come up with new product mm -hmm. like, like projects and stuff like that, but like there's gotta be something else we can do than right. keep on remaking stuff from like the thirties and forties. Yeah. Like <laughs> come so on. This is kind of similar to the argument we had about the Willy Wonka thing that Paul King's doing. My personal yeah. opinion is, as long as it's a talented director doing it, I don't care what it is. I the Franken yeah. like you could take the Frankenstein part out. I don't really care. Even if you like, even if that's the only thing, as long as you have Lord Ghost Lanthimos, I'm on board. I love his films. I yeah. love the favorite. I love the lobster. The favorite is probably like top thirty movie of all time for me. Maybe top twenty five. It's, it's pretty high up there. Um, we got Wicked. Um, John M. Chu, director of Crazy Rich Asians and In the Heights, will be tapped to film the adaptation of that. So he's clearly uh, going on the Broadway train of movies right now. Hey, I mean, like, um, Wicked, huh? That's yeah. certainly interesting. I mean, like, uh, that's certainly, like, this is a property that has not been adapted yet to film. I mean, like, I actually am interested to see that because, like, I don't mind these Broadway adaptations as long as they're good, you know? I as mean, like, they're not like the problem. The yeah, we keep on ragging on the problem, honestly. But, like, come on, man. Like, just, I don't know. As long as it's done good, I don't yeah. care what it's adapted by. But at the same time, when something's been done too much, there's a point where you got to just let it die or let it be, like, remembered yeah. in film history, to I be mean, honest. There's a lot of film adaptations coming up. We got Lynn manuels and Miranda's directorial debut for Tick, Tick, Boom. I don't know if you saw that. That's happening. No, yeah, I did. Um, yep. Steven Spielberg's West Side Story recreation. At John M. Chu in the Heights. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So that's, that's Sorry, kind of speaking of Steven Spielberg, did you see that his son has recently come out with a horror film? Did not. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but I saw an ad for it on, um, on what's it called, the Daily Mail? I don't know Something why like I read that, that crap, but... Okay, I don't know. Yeah, but I it's... Know, I, I mean, hey, I didn't know he was directing. That's pretty cool, you know? Great way to keep any of the family tradition, so... Yeah. Anyways, let's move on. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Um... Last thing, we got an image of Jared Leto as the Joker. I don't know if you can see that very well. That looks suspiciously like Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. It does, okay. Gonna... Look, it doesn't look like Jared Leto that much. It does look suspiciously <sighs> Why is Jared Leto even still in the DCE? I'm sorry. Like, seriously, he wasn't. I don't think he was very good as Joker in uh, Suicide Squad. Because yeah. I know Suicide Squad is bad. I don't know. It's weird. Um, last thing I wanted to say was that Sunda at Sundance, uh, obviously there was some movies that came out, obviously some indies that are looking to get bought by some big studios. The big winner from that was Coda, a film that won uh, the Grand Jury Prize, the Audience Award, Best Director, Screenplay, and Film Ensemble at the, at the festival, um, and got bought for, I think, $25 million by Apple. Mm -hmm. It's about, yep. uh, so CODA stands for Child of Deaf Adult, and about, uh, it's a coming of age film dealing with that kind of unique subject matter of a girl who can hear, obviously, but has deaf parents, who's obviously, who can talk a lot because her parents are deaf, right? And kind of yeah. explores that kind of thing. I haven't seen it, obviously. I don't know too much about it. Um, the other Sundance thing that did very well was Mass. Um, a film where I know a little more about this. It's where the parent of a school shooter and the parent of one of the victims meet several years later and confronts each other about the tragedies that happened. Um, huh. It's a very apparently very powerful film. The uh, the performances are very much being praised for that film and uh, are said to be looking out for Oscars for them as well. So, hey, I mean, like that sounds interesting. I bet like that's certainly. A unique type of film i don't know if i've ever heard of a film like that before i mean like i'd, I'd love to see that yeah sweet yeah. all right cool all right that's pretty much all the movie news i have so i think we can get into talking about our main uh topic of the day so we had yep. a school project where we had to do a film review we each picked something different i we actually technically didn't either pick narrative films or what you typically think of a feature film we picked yeah. two projects from ava duvernay I picked uh, the limited series, When They See Us, uh, from Netflix, released in 2019. Aiden picked 13th, directed, also directed by David DuVernay, a documentary also available on Netflix and made by Netflix. Yeah. So, um, which one do you want to talk about first, Aiden? 
Yeah, hey, I mean, like, you go ahead, man. I would, right. I would love to hear some more about your series. It's been a while since I've seen that one. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so when they see us, um, I think this is a masterpiece. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's the best limited series I've ever seen. I haven't seen a ton of them. I've seen, like, The Queen's Gambit, a couple other things. So my stance is a little bit lower, but I think it's just so well done. The episode 4 in particular is the most experimental, but I think it very much pays off in a lot of ways, creating this kind of, like, it taps into a psychological feeling that I haven't seen in many movies that deal with, like, um, these kind of things like Black Injustice and um, Prison, specifically. As you see, uh, yeah. Jarrell Jerome as Corey Wise sitting in prison, making decisions that aren't great in prison, as well as just thinking of what could have happened. There's multiple scenes where he's just in solitary confinement because, obviously, since he's been accused of rape, a lot of people are going after him, especially like white neo Nazis who live in jail. So he's just staying in solitary, yeah. stay away from them. And there's long scenes of him where he's just doing things like pretending he's playing basketball with the ripped up magazines that this nice guard gave him. He's thinking about what could have happened if he had just stayed at the um, the restaurant he was at before he ended up going to the park with those with the boys. Um, and what could have, what and you can imagine the sequence where he goes with the girl he's dating at the time and goes to Coney Island and it's so much and Ava does a very good job contrasting that with the darkness and coldness of the solitary confinement because he she brightens up all the colors of the Coney Island park and um, it's a very interesting scene and Jarrell Jerome's transformation I think is very impressive I think it's probably why they gave him the Emmy he does a very he's the only person who stays the same. Uh, has this is the same actor between um, the boys when they're young and the boys when they're older because he was able to make that transition by g gaining some muscle, I think probably giving some stuff to make him feel a bit taller and also the facial hair and the hair really emphasize that. And I think I'm talking about the last episode because it's what I saw most recently. But yeah, it's just very, it's very well done. I don't know what else to say. No, no, I definitely agree. I mean, like from what I remember, I remember, I think I saw it when it came out. It was very very powerful but yeah. also very hard to watch because like sure. in some movies you can like you can sit through that stuff right because you know oh, you know this is just a movie you yeah. know this or this is a series you know this shit isn't real but no this shit actually happened and i think that's what makes it even more difficult it's just it's so gut-wrenching to see what the system like did to these like kids that just ripped a big portion of their lives away and that's something they can never get back no matter how much money they get paid by the city of new york yeah or, like how many thoughts and prayers are given to them? Mm -hmm. yeah, that nothing. time of their life is gone forever over nothing. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. They had to deal with going to prison and being labeled as sex offenders, sexual predators yeah. for so long. As, as soon as they were like brought into, once the police created that narrative, it was done. Pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Many of the newspapers didn't, like in media, didn't use the word alleged. So they were basically condemned by everyone except the court of law as soon as they, the police gave that story. And then they were condemned from everyone once they were found guilty of the crime that they clearly did not commit. And yeah. the ending, like, it's a little, it's kind of like the Shawshank Redemption ending where there's, like, a person you think might be able to redeem him. In this case, he does. People sometimes complain about those things getting resolved a little too easily and think, even, like, in something like Molly's Game, where she gets, like, kind of resolved when he has that conversation with her dad, you think that's probably too easy of a wrap up for like, yeah. even though it's a true story, you can kind of see that, but I think Ava definitely plays more to the idea of Jarrell, like Corey Wise, the character getting used to prison. Cause he's only 16 when he's thrown yeah. into the adult prison system. So he is just, he doesn't have a good time. The guards have had, had arranges for him to basically get beat up so that he'll like buy him chocolate bars, but at least like, it's chocolate bars it could be something a lot more like it could have been worse and he's just yeah. talking about how he's just like he hates prison and obviously i don't think prison's any place you want to go but then sometimes he makes it worse for himself because he asks for a transfer and then he gets transferred to a place where his mom can't see him so oh pretty tough yeah and yeah Shit, i forgot about that one yeah that was yeah. a rough time yeah for sure i think this yeah. is probably the piece of media i've cried the most at because of how this powerful the performances are and how sad this whole situation is especially the first episode when you're just seeing these kids who are teenagers getting grilled by the police like 
hit, attack, yell that, or any you kind of feel that passage of time because they're in there for so long, and I think Ava yeah. executes everything that the story encompasses so very well. No, for real. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Great piece of media. I mean, like I, I think I might watch, want to watch that again. It's been a, like I said, a couple of years since I've seen that, but no, definitely something you know you want to revisit or want to see for the first time. Like it's on Netflix now. Please go check it out if you sure. have not seen it already. Absolutely. What are you giving this then? Out of ten? Out of ten, I gave it a ten out of ten. There are probably a few flaws with it. I haven't been able to find them. I think the film critic in me kind of dissolved after taking a hiatus from movie for like for nine days. I pretty much, I've gave everything I've seen so far a five out of ten out of ten. I saw this. Yeah. I finished wrap, wrapping up seeing this, which I already thought was very good. And I also saw rewatched the Grand Budapest Hotel. Love that movie. Um, oh, great movie! Yeah, yeah, the great movie. Um, yeah, the performances are definitely the standout, though. I can see why they were kind of the most nominated thing. There was a lot of nominations for it, and uh, I can see why they're all very good. They're all, you, you believe that they are these people, even though you know they're actors, but they really yeah. adapt to that extremely well. All right. Uh, it reminds cool, me cool, that cool. I wanted to say this one last funny story. Someone accused Ava DuVernay of like product placement. Or the one scene where when Corey Wise is doing the tape confession, there's a Pepsi can on the desk. It that thing is that was taken from the actual footage. There was a Pepsi can on the desk he was sitting at while he was giving it. So a little bit silly that. Hey, that had to be right. accurate. I mean, yeah, exactly. nothing wrong with that. She, she cared about every detail. You can see how much detail she put into the outfits. They looked like the exact same thing. All the app. and the creation of like the 1990 Harlem is very well. It placed the. It, since it takes place in 1989, it plays the Fight the Power song. That's yeah. When Do the Right Thing came out, and that's when that song also came out. And it specifically says 1989, so it very much fits that well. It very much correlates with that movie and kind of proves that Spike Lee was right. That kind of stuff is still happening. You know? Yeah. No, I totally, yeah. Uh, it's crazy. I mean, like, I don't, I don't know if... I can't remember if they talked about this in the film or not, but like Donald Trump actually took out yeah, a full I, page they did talk to about condemn those guys. Film. They do have a scene where the mom reacts to him taking out that eighty-five thousand dollar ad. Just to think that man became president, David DuVernay is just like, yeah, this is the pre- this is the man you put in the Oval Office. Yeah, it's low. It's low-key yeah. kind of. Well, I mean, like it's. I don't want to say it's funny because it's not, but it's, it's funny not. in a messed up way, you know. Yeah, it's. it's like, just, I, I guess it's, it's more it's, ironic, you know. Or like yeah, just so I real that you know he was yeah. advocating for the death penalty to be brought in New York City, accusing well, like basically saying that these boys should go to prison, like not just to prison that they should die, even though they hadn't even been convicted of the crime yet. They didn't, he didn't even worry about whether they were guilty or not at all. Yeah, and obviously yeah. people at this point, you know, in nineteen ninety, people think racism is a little bit closer to over, right? People, you know, it's a little better of a society, but. Things like this just show things are just not okay, and they still no, we still got a long, a long way to go. It's been clear this past year; it's still not okay. Yeah, no, not totally okay. agree. Yeah. yeah. Um. All right. All right. Yeah, I just want to say, yeah, so many talented people involved in this. Ava DuVernay is very much a talented visionary, and I think um, she should try to write her own story. I think. That's the cha- If I was like a person to give her a challenge as far as what she does next in her life, I'd say for her to write her own original screenplay. Um, I think she's very talented. I think she needs to try to find a way to tell a more like obviously that to take these adaptations like or telling some true stories are very good, but I think she could definitely create something unique and original. Yeah. So I would like to see. No, that. I definitely definitely agree with that. Yeah, I mean. Of course, her adaptations are great, but, you know, yeah, like you said, it would be nice to see what she can truly do when she's given, like, total creative freedom. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now we can move on to the film that I chose, 13th, which is a documentary film. So it's not something I would typically talk about because, yeah. I mean, like, honestly, I do love a good documentary film, but it doesn't seem to, like, not as many people, like, in my audience seem to, like, they don't really seem to like those types of movies. They kind of, like, want to yeah. see, like, movies with, like, a bit more of a story, not just, like, spitting facts at you and making you feel depressed for, like, 90 minutes. But, I mean, this is probably the best documentary film I think I've ever seen. I mean, the attention to detail is impeccable. Like, they show, like, all these crazy stats. Like, did you know that the U.S. has more prisoners as a bigger prison population than China? And that's I, the thing that this, yeah. like... Yeah, yeah no, I, I think that's crazy. Kind of, yeah, like I, 
Well, yeah. I, I watched the documentary. Before, I didn't really. I knew they had the hype. Like, yeah. obviously, the stat they specifically used at the beginning is Obama saying that the United States is 5% of the world's population, yet 25% of the world's prisoners. Yeah, it's crazy, to be it's honest. Crazy. And I mean, like, just to... Just to quickly clarify, this fil- this like documentary film explores the uh, clause, this like the Thirteenth Amendment, and there's this clause in there that's basically saying slavery is illegal, right? I'm paraphrasing, right? This isn't exactly what it says, but slavery is illegal unless it's a punishment for a crime. And that's what the whole yeah. focuses on. It explains how that one little clause has led to so much systemic racism in the United States, or at least continuing systemic racism yeah. from the time before the Civil War to after that amendment was passed. I mean, like it's crazy. Because like there's it discusses all these like insane policies that have been like disguised as like crime bills. Like there was one that Reagan passed in 1984. I think it was the Comprehensive Drug Control Act or something, C- yeah. Crime Control Act. Something like and that. And that was basically putting more like police on the street and getting and getting harsher penalties for like drug crimes, even in small right. possession, right? Right. But because a lot of the poorest communities had drugs floating in them, and as and consequently those communities were predominantly black more black people were getting locked up as a result and i think and this explains how this was designed to do it like that and then there's um like an excerpt from this guy who worked on reagan's campaign explaining that you have explaining how he disguised this racism as a crime thing and it's crazy he shows he talks about the evolution how like in like early 19th century, 1800s, you could say, you know, N-word, N-word, N-word. And then like when that came out of fashion, it was, you know, Jim Crow yeah. where it's like, mm-hmm. obviously it's still obvious, but you're not saying that word outright. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then by and then he discusses how like by the 80s, it's basically saying, yes, this is about crime control, mm-hmm. not about black people control. And I think it's, right. cr- it's crazy how like people haven't noticed this for the longest time. It's like crazy because like they just created these policies you know to police minorities and like the first time i watched it was when it i think it was like it was this summer actually when the whole george floyd shit was going on because yeah i will admit this summer i will admit i was a little bit ignorant not like really bad i mean like i just didn't know a whole lot about this subject matter and i wanted to educate myself on it so i took a look at this documentary and like it just made me so mad i couldn't believe what i was watching and it just it kind of opened my eyes to like how far we still have to go as a society. Like here I am, like, you know, obviously white male, although I'm not like completely, you know, free of like, you know, hardships obviously, but like I am still very privileged and I realize that now. And that's why I don't see these problems happening. And this movie kind of just opened up my eyes to all of these problems that are still going on to this day, whether they're outright or not, they're still happening. And I think that's the best thing about the film. Yeah. It really opens up your eyes to all these things that you wouldn't see normally. So, yeah, for sure. Jesus, I for think so it hi- <laughs> yeah, it highlights how the American government yeah. throughout the years has turned turned slavery into to a new version that was socially accepted. Yeah, from the Thirteenth Amendment to basically mass incarceration for all the freed slaves to yeah, exactly to laws to segregation to mass policing for drugs. Yes, and now specifically a lot more is with police brutality that's the main thing i think that's been highlighted yeah. in the most recent couple of decades and how it just always differs it always changes because of the things that they put into the system things like bail right they highlight yeah. that in a good portion of the film talking about yeah because bail is just so expensive and because yeah. a lot of these people being fucked up are poor african-americans are having yeah. to stay in jail or they're pleading guilty to a crime they didn't commit just so they can go home and then come back on a reduced sentence and not leave their fate up to the court. And I think that was crazy because like, you know, you're innocent, but you know, the court probably won't be able to help you. Yeah. So you just cut your losses and sacrifice what little time you have left. But, and then it explains how even after you've paid your dues, like they still punish you for it because once you have a felony conviction or any type of, you know, ex con type of thing, you're like it's harder to yeah, find a it's job it's harder, harder to get to an apartment yeah. Yeah, yeah it's hard to make a living it's hard to live and move on with your life after you've done so- after you've made a mistake and paid your yeah. time for it i think it's just crazy because then it's kind of like a rinse and repeat system and the film does an expert job yeah. explaining this how like the penal system in america is because of all the restrictions they put on felons when they're released you know they're yeah. not allowed to vote for like some in some cases right and yeah. you know obviously all that other stuff it makes them want to go back to their old life because it's like the only the thing only that can they help have, them. Right, exactly. If 
that they yeah, highlight exactly. that in thirteenth as well. They highlight how Raymond um, kid, you know, he. Oh, you mean uh, when they see us? Five, yeah, from yeah, one in when they see us. He obviously they none of the boys committed the crime, but they have to go to jail. So right, so then when they come out, they're yeah. they're felons, they're sex offenders, so they can't have there's they can't have any job involving minors. Uh, they can't have jobs that involve other felons. Um, yeah, exactly. So their ability to get a job is really hard. And Raymond's likes this girl, and this girl really wants to move into his apartment. So desperate for money, he turns to dealing, pushing crack in order to make money, and he's caught yeah. again. So it just highlights how the system kind of you kind of go through a cycle that just kind of forces you to almost go back immediately, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You see, backwards is the only way you can go forwards, and I think it's crazy that that's happening. I mean, like, the amount of... Actually, where was I going with this? I can't remember, but... No, but the point is, no, it does a great... The film does a great job yeah. at, like, explaining all this stuff. Like, it gives you, like, hard facts, too. Like, stuff that's not, you know, easily picked apart, like, for its authenticity. They give you cold, hard facts, and I think that's the craziest thing. And then they're also talking about how corporations also have an yeah. influence or on big, these laws with, like, you know, Alec. How American capitalism yeah. kind of incentivizes governments and states to create massive penal systems to create yeah. massive free labor, which is basically just a modern form of slavery. Exactly. Cause they're, they are getting paid. Right. But it's like something crazy. It's like six cents an hour. They're yeah. in jail. They don't have to be paid any wage. There's no law against that. Sometimes that can exactly. happen outside the penal system, which is really bad. And yeah. and the bail system kind of emphasizes that rich people can get out Poor people have to stay in. I don't think at that point, and obviously there has does something like there is something great because obviously there's systemic things to make minority groups obviously make it a lot harder for them to prosper, and that's why black businesses yeah. and stuff are so valued in communities. But it just shows how, like, no matter what, like, just no matter race, but just based on just economic status alone, how rich people can get out of the system, even if they commit the most heinous crime if they have enough money, they kind of like. Casual things like I think about that kind of stuff in like Better Call Saul when the like the drug like the one of the cartel leaders is able to get out of prison after he basically is, like murdered someone because the bail is only yeah. got, like three million and they have three million dollars to all the co- crimes they committed, right? But yeah. not everyone has that fortune, right? It just shows how like most people would have no chance of making that, but this person's able to, and that happens to with a lot of other people, and it's just it's really sad. It is really sad, to be honest. I mean, obviously Canada is not free. Like, we're Canadians, right, uh, for those of you who don't know. But, like, obviously our system is perfect. Like, we know that. Like, for one thing, I think trials take way too long to happen sometimes. I think so. That's very true. probably not the best thing. But, I mean, like, we also have a few other problems as well, but we don't have too, too much time to get into that. But the point is, I mean, like, I think the first step in, like, working towards, like, a better solution is acknowledging the problem. And I think that yeah. for a, a long time – there wasn't enough vocal of a presence to like call out the problem. Yeah. I think, you know, that was keep keeping it going. And I think now that we're being able to call it out more freely without like, you know, a ton of fear. And I think more people are joining this like movement to like, yeah. like get reform in our justice systems. And just with all of our systems of government, I think that I hope at least that we can make some change. Cause For sure. yeah. Cause I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to like live in a world where like, you know, we're not all equal. I yeah. mean, I mean, look at you, man. Like, I don't think of you as like, I don't think of you as an Asian person. I think of you as my best friend. And I think that's just ridiculous that someone like would think that just because you look different than me, that you're like below me. And yeah. I, I just, I hope we can get to that point one day, to be honest. I would, because yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to live like this anymore. Yeah. I mean, Sound everyone good. would like that, you know, love the world the same, all the people yeah. together. It's like Whoville, all the people come together and sing. <laughs> Whoville. And like, yeah, I don't know. I just thought of that <laughs> randomly. Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. just, I mean, the world's obviously not fair. You can see that just like based on things like cancer and all the other terrible things in the world. Just people just aren't like, you know, just don't get equal treatment in this world. But obviously something yeah. like equality and things like, especially in race relations, is something that people feel you can ease, like it's a lot easier to, fix something like that than it is to fix like I don't know, global warming or well you could help fix global warming or things like war disease yeah. things like that but this is like an issue that i think people look to a lot because it's a human problem and i think yeah. often the problem is people aren't educated enough on it and i think this because 
I think people know about it, right? Especially with all yeah. the things that have been happening in social media and the news exactly, and, yeah. and all of these things. I think people know about it, but I don't think people know what led to that other than the narrative for someone like George Floyd might be, oh, here's a bad white cop in Minnesota. He's racist. He sees this black man who's sort of committing a crime, decides to kill him, basically. And yeah. it, it somewhat is that. But it starts from a, like a to- it starts from the top and it, it's it's trickle down like they say trickle down economics. It's obviously something that doesn't work. It's yeah. the thing is it's basically trickle down policies and racism. Yeah, right. It's like that doesn't mean yeah like it also doesn't mean that like, is like someone like Joe Biden or yeah. even Donald Trump is the person who causes. It just starts with it. Like no one knows what this roots is. It goes back hundreds of years to whoever first thought, okay, let's go to Africa and take some slaves. But also, you can't really blame that person because if it wasn't him, it probably would have been another person, right? It's same. Yeah. It's like the same thing. Like in the Bible, people's like, oh, it's Adam and Eve's fault for sin. Like obviously, no, it's someone else would have sinned. That's how the world works, yeah. right? People are exactly. eventually going to make mistakes. But you yeah. think that, and unfortunately, like as society, like we can only really move as fast as our slowest idiot sometimes because yeah, that's the way that true. society keeps going yeah yeah sometimes you yeah yeah exactly it's like and sometimes it's like technically one slow person like in a group of 10 it's like 10 percent of the population doesn't agree with this and it's still like divided on these simple issues from most people's yeah. perspective it's not going to move forward because of how radical they are against it right and i think yeah. a documentary does like this is so essential because it educates right I think the yeah. main thing is educating about these kind of issues. Like, I knew um, one of the per- people who's fondly featured in this documentary, Brian Stevenson, from reading his book Just Mercy, which also has a yeah. meditation. Both are very good. Um, and I like my interest in law led me to things like this. And when you get interested in law, you kind of just see how, like, how law is built, but then how broken it can sometimes be, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think what this film does is, I think it's very, it's very easy to digest. It makes all these sometimes complicated things it's like, where does racism come from? How does it work from government? And it makes it pretty easy for people to understand, right? It's not, yeah. And unlike something like the trends on Twitter or Instagram, it's something that should stick in your head, cold hard facts, like you said, that should stick with your head and help inform you about why these things are happening, why they exist. Yeah. No, exactly. I totally agree with that, man. Yeah, exactly. It's a great education tool. I mean, like, obviously, there are some areas in the film, in the documentary film where it's just it strays a little bit too much from the overarching subject matter. But I think right. for the most part, it does a great job. So I don't it's have very, a lot to complain yeah, about here. It's very, yeah, it's a very good documentary. Yeah. Um, I think the nature of the subject kind of holds it down from being more visually uh, creative, personally. Yeah, um, because like, you don't want to be too over the top, You also like you don't want to be too over the top at the same time because it's the nature of like you can't turn like these events like on un- unlike when they see us, you can't make a very well shot kind of event thing right of like the whole history yeah. of racism. You kind of have to stem from things like interviews and you know those important lyrics that are being put, like with images and it's simple animation, right? Yeah, Which exactly. Is why I don't think it's a perfect document but it's still very, very good, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, like I, the I, documentary I, format is sometimes limiting, like you said, yeah. but I mean, for the most part, it does a good job, so. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, yeah. I didn't ask, did you have, like, a score for when they see us? Because I said I do. Um, oh, actually, yeah, we probably should, yeah. It, but. Yeah, well, from what I remember, I, I'd say it's, like, a 9, 9.5 out of 10, you know? Right. As for 13th, yeah. though, I'd probably give this, probably give this, like, a 9. Nine yeah, out of ten. I would also give this a nine out of ten. It's yeah. very solid. So yeah, so check did. these both out. Like anyone who's watching this, like we we don't have the biggest audience right now, but that's okay. YouTube's algorithm is not great, but anyone who sees this, please go check these films out. They're, I mean, they're please essential. go check the media out I'd on Netflix. Like, yeah, they are essential. They're essential if you want to educate yourself on like the overall issue at hand. Obviously, they're not. It's a good starting point. So don't get all your information from this. I yeah. incur- we encourage you to do some more research, especially because. It is Black History Month. We actually weren't even thinking about Black History Month yeah. when we decided to do this video. It just kind of happened to be exactly. like this because we were both doing Ava DuVernay projects and then it kind of formulated from there, right? Yeah. So please educate yourself if you're having, if you don't understand this problem at all, we, we encourage you to do that. It's a big issue that we all need to work together on to overcome. Yeah.
All right, well, that's the video. Follow me on Instagram at GBD Reviews. Please follow this guy. I mean, subscribe to this guy on YouTube. Yeah, He's a viewing. great content creator. Like I said, my best friend. We collaborate a lot together. We yeah. got to do this yeah. for him. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so, Aiden, what do you think is going to be our film for next week? Well, continuing with uh, Black History Month, I think I'm going to go with Queen and Slim. Right. Let's go with Queen Slim. Uh, yeah. Queen Slim, 2019 film starring Daniel Kaluuya. Don't know much else other than that. Uh, I'll find the director for next episode. But yep. um, thank you so much for watching. Um, yeah, make sure to check out both of our social slash YouTube channels. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Bye, guys. See you guys. Mix my soda. Feeling connected to God. Trying to get closer. Stepping on roaches. Me and my loasters. Just trying to get over. Try not to get swallowed by locusts. Trying to stay focused, kind of like most. Like somebody chose us. Sweat on my shoulder. I feel these emotions. But still, I keep going.